Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. As part of our new HBR Minute series, spotlighting thought-provoking HBR videos and their key takeaways, today I explore Robin Eli's recent HBR video, The Culture of Overwork Hurts Everyone. Welcome back to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HBR Minute episode, today I explore Robin Eli's recent HBR video, The Culture of Work Hurts Everyone. The standard work-family narrative is an outdated excuse for what holds women back. Ask people to explain why women remain so dramatically underrepresented in the senior ranks of most companies, and you will hear from the vast majority a lament that goes something like this. High-level jobs require extremely long hours. Women's devotion to family makes it impossible to put in those hours, and so their career inevitably suffers. However, the research doesn't actually bear this out. Robin, Eli, and colleagues spent 18 months working with a global consulting firm that wanted to know why it had so few women in positions of power. Although virtually every employee the authors interviewed related a form of the standard explanation, the firm's data told a different story. Women weren't being held back because of troubling balance of work and family. Men, too, suffered from that problem and nevertheless advanced. Women were held back because they were encouraged to take accommodations, such as going part-time and shifting to internally facing roles, which derailed their careers. The real corporate in women's stalled advancement, the authors conclude, is a general culture of overwork that hurts both sexes and locks gender inequality in place. To solve this problem, they argue, we must reconsider what we're willing to allow the workplace to demand of all employees. As we explore this video audio together, I will intersperse some of my own comments, some of my own thoughts and insights as we try to understand better how to deal with work-life balance issues and support women in the workplace. I'll catch you on the flip side of this first clip. The culture of overwork creates a situation where people daily have to choose. If you're going to work here, you got to choose between work and personal life. For many people, that's work and family. Because we think of that as a problem of work-family conflict, the way that they address it and the way many companies do is work-family accommodations, which are great. The problem with work-family accommodations in a context, in a culture of overwork, is that people who take them are seen as uncommitted <laughs> and, their, and their careers are derailed. It's like, well, oh, if I, ha- I want to work here and be successful, I'm going to have to give up that part of my life. I'm going to only have work. I'm not going to have love. And so we end up with these kinds of cultures of overwork that have all sorts of negative implications, among them that it's really hard for women to advance in them. There are many ways in which a culture of overwork can be damaging for organizations and for their employees. In this first clip, she lays out that that's a problem, but she also alludes at the very end of the clip about how this is particularly a problem for women. Uh, Disproportionately, overwork hurts women. The expectation that you put in long hours, that you're available 24-7, and that you are always responsive to the beck and call of your leader, your customer, that disproportionately hurts women because they disproportionately bear more of the burden when it comes to home care, child care, house care, elder care, uh, and all of those sorts of responsibilities outside of the workplace. But it also isn't that simple because it's not just women that it hurts, it hurts men who also participate in those sorts of caregiving responsibilities and housework responsibilities and 
all in all, when you overwork your people, it just hurts the overall performance of the firm. It creates higher levels of burnout. It it uh, reduces the amount of creativity uh, and innovation that occurs because people are putting in FaceTime, they're putting in hours, but they're not necessarily being productive. Everybody has the same explanation for why women aren't advancing. This work requires 24-7 availability. Women um, are not able to meet that requirement because of, you know, when they have children, they're devoted to their children, and that's why they haven't advanced. The narrative is, it's a, it's a problem women have, not men. Men are the workers, men go to work, and women stay home with the, with the kids. In fact, what we saw for both men and women is, is a real wish to be at work um, and to fulfill their work ambitions, and a real wish to have a personal life, whether it's with kids or community um, or spouses, partners. Everybody was feeling the, the tension of, of having to go to one side or the other in a context that basically says, you need if you're going to work here and you're going to be successful, you need to be available 24-7. Women are going against the cultural grain. Men are going with it. And they're both paying a price. Women are going against the cultural grain, and men are going with it. That is a very profound insight that she shares right at the end of that second clip. And it really is important to note that, of course, we're not a monolith. Of course, not all women act and behave the same or have the same desires or goals. Not all men do either. And while on the aggregate, uh, women disproportionately do and, and hold an overburden of the home care, the house care, and all of those elements, there are many men who, who also do the same. And the bottom line is it, it does hurt both. It hurts men and women when an organization has a culture of overwork and when they expect people to, to put the firm first over their family. And rather than having some sort of a balance in work and family life, they, they just expect loyalty and commitment to the firm first. That is incredibly damaging. Uh, and of course, it's disproportionately damaging to women, but it hurts men as well. We need to shake up that narrative. We need to, that's, it's such an old school narrative. It's something that was perhaps uh, more accurate uh, 30, 40 years ago, but we've been shifting for, for decades. And that narrative is just not accurate anymore. And we need to tell a new story. We need to support women and men both, but we need, particularly women, we need to support women so that they can feel like, yes, they can both be productive and successful in the workplace and take on leadership roles, but also they can have balance and they can have a family life. And in fact, when we have better work-life balance, when we have when we practice self-care and when we, we have more balance in our lives overall, we will be more productive for the firm. Culture of overwork is 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 a is a is a good pithy way to describe it because it is a culture, um, and it is overwork. This is, I think, particularly true in professional service firms. Very often, you'll hear, "Well, you know, the client, you have to be at the beck and call of the client," and so that could be who knows where the client is in the world, or you know, and that's what forces the the tension. I think I've studied enough professional service firms to be able to say that. That imperative is a myth. I'm not saying people don't need to work hard. I'm not saying that there aren't sometimes points when you might have to pull an all-nighter and, you know, uh, spend a weekend at the office, whatever. But this kind of constant, relentless, 24-7 availability is um, really fabricated for other purposes. We really don't need to be making ourselves available to the company and to our customers 24-7. Now, depending on the business, perhaps we do need to have shift work and we do need to have people who can cover different hours of the day. I'm not saying that's not the case. And as she said in that clip, uh, we're not saying that you don't need to work hard, that you don't need to uh, 
um, put in long hours at times, work weekends at times, work late sometimes. That's not the point. The point is that we shouldn't have to be doing that always. That shouldn't be the constant expectation because that just leads to burnout. And it's just not accurate. It's just not what firms expect. And so if as an organization and as leaders, we tell our people that they need to make themselves available, uh, we, we are not being honest. It's a disingenuous uh, way to try to get more out of your people and it disproportionately hurts women. It's really serving this other function of, um, you know, allowing uh, among a group of highly ambitious, competitive people to stand out as the superstar. So we heard stories um, of uh, consultants saying, you know, we put together these hundred slide decks and we've spent the entire weekend perfecting them. I mean, a hundred slides, like a client does not want a hundred slides. So why do we do it? We do it because it's our opportunity to prove how smart we are, how smart and analytical we are. It has nothing to do with what the client needs. It has nothing to do with maintaining the competitiveness of the firm. And in fact, there's research to suggest that that kind of um, that that kind of overwork is actually undermining ultimately of a firm's competitiveness because it burns people out. It you know there's all sorts of negative um, repercussions of, of that kind of requirement. Part of what she's saying here is that we need to work smarter, not harder. Right? If we're working all weekend to put together a hundred slides for a slide deck for a client that doesn't actually want it or doesn't ask for that then what are we actually accomplishing? We're spinning our wheels for nothing. Organizations do so much of that. And oftentimes leaders, particularly those who have expectations, arbitrary expectations for FaceTime, for a number of hours a week put in, uh, for making sure you stay late, uh, working weekends, uh, get there before the boss gets there, leave after the boss leaves. When you have those sorts of cultural norms, it's, it's not about performance, it's not about productivity, it's just about these arbitrary norms around uh, time spent in the office and face time with your colleagues. And that doesn't actually help anybody. Uh, and it, does, it absolutely hurts everybody, particularly women. And so we need to rethink what it means to be productive in the workforce. We need to make sure that we work smarter. We need to make sure that when we are expecting people to work long hours, that there's a real reason behind it. And we're not just forcing everyone to spin their wheels uh, for no reason. And particularly if, if it's just so they have to be there because I have to be there too. Quite frankly, as an organizational scholar, I'm much more interested in actually what organizations can do about this. If they really are interested in addressing these issues of structural inequality, say, where in our culture do we see structural inequality getting reproduced? And what are the narratives? What are the kinds of interactions people are having with each other? What are our policies, our norms, and really taking a look at that? Is this, is this really true? Do we really need 24-7 availability? Is it really true that it's only women who are suffering? Uh, and, you know, do we want to change that? So there's a couple things happening in this last clip. First, she continues the discussion about structural inequalities and how that disproportionately hurts women, how we need to disrupt the norms, how we need to disrupt the systems, the processes, the policies, the practices that are unnecessarily putting women at a disadvantage in the workplace. But she also is bringing up the important fact that overwork generally is a problem and it needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed for the benefit of the firm. It needs to be addressed for the benefit of all employees. And we're not actually going to get more out of people by forcing them to work longer. In fact, recent research has showed that perhaps even reducing the normal eight-hour workday to six hours can result in higher levels of productivity and performance and greater sustainability of that high level of performance over time. So it's something we need to, to shake up these these preconceived notions of what it means to be productive, what it means to be hardworking, and let's work smarter, not harder. And in my own research, I've looked a lot at various work-life balance indicators, the ability to work from home, the work availability to have flexibility with your work hours, the availability to deal with family matters um, during the week or, or even during the workday. 
when needed, uh, and a whole bunch of other factors. And what I've found is that very consistently, uh, work life balance types of indicators are important to both men and women, particularly to women though. And that holds true throughout many parts of the world. I've done research throughout 37 different countries throughout the world, and this is important. This is important for organizations to pay attention to, and I think particularly now during a time of COVID pandemic that we need to pay attention to these sorts of work-life balance topics, and particularly for women who might be struggling to balance home care, child care, helping their, their children with schooling while they're doing online schooling because of the pandemic, so on and so forth. We need to make sure that we're not inadvertently hurting our valued employees through our practices, policies, procedures, our norms, the systems, everything that's built into the organizations. I hope you've enjoyed this HBR Minute as we've explored together this important video and this important topic about not overworking your employees. I hope, as always, that everyone stays healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day, and I hope you have a great week. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.